a spell for a moment of silence. Our dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for our awareness of your living presence among us. Now keep us aware and make us more sensitive than we've ever been before of your nearness, of your eagerness to possess us and make us and use us. Let this day be a special preparation for all of our future life, lives. And we ask it that we might be used by you in making yourself real throughout the whole earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, I'm sure that there isn't anyone in this audience that is not a Christian. Or if we aren't, we'd like to be. We wouldn't be here if we weren't seeking. And we have Jesus' own word that if we seek, we, we will find. And so this morning, we're going questing. We're seeking more of him in our own lives. We're seeking a better understanding of what it means to let him live in us. We are seeking his spirit to possess us and direct us and make us and use us. And so I believe if we're going to get the very fullness of that, we're going to have to go back and begin at the very beginning. Now we know that throughout the Old Testament times, the Messiah had been prophesied. They were looking for a savior. They were looking for a great king. But they were looking. And yet, they didn't seem to have the conception of what it was really going to be. They were looking for something great and wonderful. And yet they'd been letting their own desires on a human level color at their thinking. And when he came, so few realized it. Now God had been looking also for the person that would be ready to be the mother of this holy child. It would take someone who was utterly pure in heart, who had lost her self-sufficiency and willing to risk everything that she was on obedience to him. And he found such a person in Mary and so the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary to tell her that she was favored among women and chosen by God for this great special purpose. And naturally, she was filled with awe and reverence and fear. But the angel told her not to be afraid, that this was a wonderful thing that was going to happen and she was blessed in being chosen. I wonder how many would have been willing to face what she faced in accepting this great call. For anyone who was living only on the human plane and thinking only of the human side would have refused it. It was going to cost a great price in misunderstanding and perhaps in persecution and lack of understanding on the one whom she loved and to whom she was betrothed. And he didn't understand. 
And he wouldn't have understood had not the angel also appeared to him. And so it cost her a great price to let God direct her and make her his chosen instrument. It's going to cost us also. Anyone who steps out with God and lets him possess us and use us and go out beyond the ordinary way of thinking, and that's going to be essential today. In this great day in which you and I have been entrusted to live, God needs many who will go beyond, who will trust him to lead the way and open the doors and make possible and use for good these unknown things to us. And it's going to take the courage and the faith and the love and the oneness of spirit that Mary had. If we today are going to answer the call that's coming to us, she trusted him. And God enabled her to have the courage and the faith and to, I'm sure, find sheer joy through it all, even though the neighbors might not understand. Even though in that wicked little city of Nazareth, they didn't believe that this child that was coming was of the Holy Spirit. Many of us will have to be misunderstood, perhaps, in the things that God may call us to do, for it will lead us out beyond the ordinary range of things. It's going to be necessary today if we're going to let the world know in the enough time that this is God's world. If we're going to be instruments which, through which God may prove and make the nations prove the wonder of his righteousness. For he is causing the nations and everyone to prove his way. We prove his way just as much through failure. For we are always proving, if we do not follow his way, that our way fails. And he is making us prove his way, whether it's following or disobeying. And God is calling us today to let the living Christ be born in us and to be willing to follow him out into unknown paths and be enabled through the power of his Spirit to do things that we've never dreamed of attempting and that we know very well we can't do except in his strength and his grace and his wisdom and under his direction. He's calling to us today to let him be born anew in us. And it's going to take the same kind of faith and courage and purity of living that Mary had to offer. And yet every one of us could give it. For he waits to blot out all the failures of the past and even to forget them. Except that we need the experience of the agony of the wrong way to lead us on into the unknown way. I think it's rather thrilling to know how God can direct every soul, good or bad, and work them into his purposes. And in the scripture reading this morning, we saw how he used Caesar Augustus to fulfill the prophecy in the Old Testament. Little did Caesar Augustus know that God was using him. No, not often do we realize how God is using us. 
But when we're one in spirit with him and are sensitive, he uses us. Maybe we'll never know. But that's all right. He knows. He used Caesar Augustus to make the call for all people to go back to their native city to register, that there might be an enrollment. And even though Mary and Joseph were living in Nazareth, they had to go to Bethlehem to be enrolled. They did not realize that they were being led there to fulfill the scriptures. But when we're sensitive, God takes care of all the details. We never have to worry about God's part. We only have to be sure that we are sensitive and obedient and one in spirit with him that we may be led. And so they, in obedience, even though the time of fulfillment for Jesus to be born was practically at hand. They go in obedience. And when they arrive in Bethlehem, the inn is filled. Naturally, they had hoped to be there where she might be comfortable and have accommodation. But the inn was filled. And the only place where Jesus could be born, it seems, was in a stable, and he was laid in a manger. I think there's much in that for us to learn. You know, this kingdom could have been here a long time ago if our ends hadn't been filled, if our lives hadn't been cluttered with so much of the things of earth so many things that, that we had chosen and seemed just absolutely essential. And on the human realm, perhaps they were. But the kingdom will not come until we are more aware of these things beyond the human, until our inner senses have been developed our sense of seeing the invisible that's all around us far. If our eyes could be opened, our inner eyes this morning, we would all see that this auditorium is filled with a multitude of the heavenly host, with those witnesses around which all of us are surrounded. Yes, heaven itself is filling this auditorium. And yet most of us have not developed our sense of seeing that we might be aware. Our ends are filled. Most of us have not developed our sense of hearing and knowing that this room is filled with voices. Not only the voices that we might catch if we tune them in on the radio or the television, but it's filled with heavenly voices. God is trying to speak to every one of us. And yet our ends are filled. We haven't had time to develop these inner spiritual senses and God is still having to resort to the stable. To go into the unexpected places to find room. The marvel is that God will enter any place, no matter how lowly. He'll enter into any heart, any mind, any life, anywhere where they'll make him room. He's chosen everyone, but most of us have not chosen him. And it's only they who have responded to his choice and his call to whom he may come in and fill our lives and be born anew and live in us. 
and make the kingdom real through us. Make his way known among men because he found room in our hearts and our lives. Now there were in the fields round about Bethlehem shepherds who were watching their flock by night. If you ever noticed in the Old Testament how many of the wonderful things God was able to give the shepherds. They were away from the noise and the bustle and the hurry of life. They were out among the beauty of God, the beauty that could be seen in the daytime and then the other beauty that could be seen only at night. And without a lot of distracting things to take their attention away from God and the wonder of the things he gives us, in the stillness, in the quietness, they saw more, they heard more. God was able to give them more than most people. And so here in Palestine, where they should have known and they did know their scriptures, for the Jewish people knew their scriptures far better than we. They knew a Messiah was coming. They knew the prophecies. They could recite them glibly. And yet only the shepherds seemed to behold this wonderful scene that night. And there upon the hills round about Jerusalem, an angel of the Lord appeared, and the glory of the Lord shone round about him. And around about them, the glory of the Lord. And they were filled with fear. I wonder how we would feel if God suddenly opened our eyes and we could see what's around us. Would we be afraid? Or would we be filled with reverence and awe and joy? and wonder. They were filled with fear. But the angel said, Be not afraid. For behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that shall be to all people. For in the city of, in the, in the city of David, is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You will find him wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel a multitude of the hosts of heaven praising God and saying glory to God in the highest and on earth peace goodwill that's what everyone's seeking every one of us here are seeking peace Everyone throughout God's earth is looking for peace. There'll never be peace until we first have goodwill among all men. We aren't going to have that until they've all heard the good news. That God, the Father of everyone, loved his children so much whether we've loved him or not, whether we've obeyed him or not, he still loves us all. And he has awaiting every one of us good news and a great joy which shall be to all people. You know, sometimes we fail to take in the bigness 
of what the angel was saying. This good news shall be to all people, which means to me that someday all people shall know it. All people shall hear it. And anyone who hears it shall be won by it. Oh, there's great wonder in these things that we see here. Think of it. In all of the Holy Land, among God's chosen people, only the shepherds saw the wonder of that scene. Only the shepherds were sensitive to hear the wonder of the angel's message and the song of the multitudes of heavenly hosts. Yet everyone could have. But today, only we who are sensitive, only we who choose to take time to go apart and be still and quiet and develop these inner senses are aware and will be ready to do our full part in what God is calling us to do. Everyone has a part. A part of this kingdom is dependent upon everyone. But only we who are sensitive and aware and courageous enough to follow in the unknown path will he be able to use in these crucial days. I believe that this that we are beginning to see today is the thing that Glenn Clark and Glenn Harding and Star Daly and Alice Craft, for I think they are the beginners. They are the ones who have been with this great dream from the beginning. I'm sure they didn't catch the wonder of where God was leading them. But at least they were faithful. At least they were offering their very all that God might lead them and uh, begin a great dream, a great spiritual adventure. And that adventure has been growing until now. Glenn is over on the other side and the power is multiplied. And this great vision is moving out into another realm. More power. Now some of us may be thinking, oh, but things like that don't happen today. <clears throat> we live in uh, a world of reality. We are more practical. Are we? This old kingdom isn't going to come by just practical people. It's never going to be organized into fulfillment. It's going to be led. And only we who have the faith to step out and be led and to follow on can God use to make it real. Things are happening just as wonderful today when our lives are just as committed as Mary's, when our courage is just as great, when our faith is just as unshakable. And so I think I'm going to tell you of one experience that happened within the last year, because lots of us seem to think these things just cannot happen, and they are happening. But you know, we don't dare tell it to many people. I haven't told this to many people. I've told it in Koinonia, for I knew they'd understand. I knew they'd follow. And I've told it to small groups where I knew their lives were committed. But I feel led to tell it this morning. Last fall, in October, 
through our wonderful Dr. Thomas Carruth, who is the head of the prayer movement for all of Methodism, who is really pouring his whole life into making prayer real and uh, trying not to go a step ahead of the Lord. Or any step we run ahead of the Lord is a false step and brings us in trouble. And so Thomas is really trying to stay one step behind the Lord instead of ahead of him. But the Lord had led him that we really must win the ministers first. No people are higher than their leaders. You just don't go much higher than your leaders. And so it's necessary that our ministers catch this great vision and be willing to let God lead them step by step and not depend upon the organization. And the orders that come down from above, just do it this way and it's this Sunday and uh, here's your literature and follow it through and don't have any creativity about you. To follow. Now, I know many ministers that have been chafing under it. Why, they're hardly allowed to express what the Holy Spirit is giving them. They have a program that must be followed, and uh, on this Sunday it must be this, and it must be done this way, and you must give your report about it. Well, we know that it's going to have to be changed. And so Thomas Cruz is starting in the right way. He's gathering together groups of ministers. And they're lay people because unless at least there's one lay person in the minister's audience that is with him and understands and knows he hasn't really just stepped off the handle, why, uh, it might be rather hard for him. And so he's been planning a series of retreats for ministers, and each minister bring one or two of his leading lay people, and the officers of the Women's Society, which made it about even, just about as many men as women, but all of them leaders, for it is important that our leaders catch the vision. Now, last October, this retreat was planned for the North Mississippi Conference, although many in the South Mississippi Conference heard about it and leaked in. And of course, they were welcomed. You see, he'd been having them for two years, and they loved them. It was to meet in this Methodist assembly just about six miles out of Oxford, which is their university center. And there... Uh, conference grounds was a very ideal place for having it. A beauty spot, comfortable, away from the noise and the bustle of things, where we could really be alone with God. Thomas Carruth and I were going to try to let the Lord lead us to lead them. As I was traveling from Starkville to Oxford, it happened that the young minister knew, and I hadn't heard yet, that Thomas Carruth had been suddenly called to the Pacific coast to uh, pinch hit for Harry Denman, who was unable to meet the uh, much more important, they thought, engagement there than here. And uh, so I happened to say to him, he was asking me for some information, and I said, well, wait till we get there and ask that of Thomas. He said, oh, hadn't you heard Thomas won't be there? <laughs> and I said, no, I hadn't heard that. <laughs> well, he said, no, he's been suddenly called west. Uh, you're the leader. I said, oh, no, you're mistaken. <laughs> it's going to be the Lord that's going to lead this group. I'm going to be a very small little wire for him to flow through. But it should be wonderful for when we are all thrown completely on the Holy Spirit and on that alone, it should be a wonderful meeting. And I found that I wasn't even bothered about it at all. I have learned one lesson. Not to get concerned about God's part. 
And I knew that this was going to be God's part, and uh, the more unconcerned I was, the better job he'd do. Well, we had a very chosen group. I find that that's wonderful when we let God really move the hearts of the people who want it. When we don't really press in people that would come without being completely sold on it. There was no pressure put on it. Every minister knew he was invited. And he was invited to come and bring his leading late people. But there was no pressure put. If he really wasn't ready for a great experience, he didn't accept the invitation and there were no questions asked. The ones who came really responded to God's call in their heart. And we had a very chosen group. We knew as soon as we assembled the first time that uh, Christ was the leader. And that the ones that were here were ready to, to follow the invisible Christ anywhere he led. And even before we went to bed the first night, we knew that unity of spirit had been attained. We knew that a great joy had come into our hearts and our minds and that something wonderful was going to happen. And it continued the next day, getting higher and higher, and each time we'd wonder, well, can it go any higher? And really, once the thought crossed my mind, which was negative, that said, oh, wouldn't this be awful? We are so high, wouldn't it be awful if it starts to flop? and go backward. Of course, that was a wicked thought. But I had never seen it go any higher. <laughs> and uh, I surely didn't want it to do that. But then quickly I threw it back on the Lord. And uh, I thought, well, now that's your business, Lord. I don't have to worry about that. Well, by the middle of the second day, and we were to close with lunch on the third day, <clears throat> a young minister and it was one of the very young ministers, who was foreign-born. He was a native of Greece. Arose and he said, Miss Eggleston, I don't think there's anyone here that isn't aware that the Holy Spirit is in our midst and that the Holy Spirit is possessing us and leading us out into unknown paths. I feel that this is a group that I can talk to about a great concern that I have in my heart. He said last June when our conference met, there came to our conference one of the most beloved ministers that we've ever had. He was in the last days of leukemia. Everybody knew it. He knew it. The doctors had told him he had very few days left to live. And he said, even so, please take me to conference. I want to go to conference just once more. I've never missed conference. And I don't want to miss. And knowing that he couldn't live anyhow, they thought they might as well grant his wish. And so he, in his pathetic condition was brought to conference. He said he had just threw a pall of sadness over the whole conference. That wherever you'd see a couple ministers talking together, if you'd listen, they were saying, poor dear Brother Jay, isn't it just pathetic to see him? He who has been such an inspiration, such a wonderful soul, and seemingly had so many wonderful years ahead of him. Isn't it just heartbreaking to see him? He said, I listened in on so many of these, and every time I heard it, something within me would say, well, why don't you pray? You're admitting that so many wonderful years could lie before him. You're admitting what a wonderful person he is and how God has used him. Why don't you suggest that the whole conference pray? And he said each time something within me said, well, suggest it. And then I would think, oh, but I'm a Greek. I'm not even, uh, they wouldn't even consider me one of them, even though I am a naturalized citizen. 
to many of them, I'm still a foreigner. And I'm brand new in the conference. And they'd think I was an upstart if I suggested such a thing. And he said, I would keep still. And conference closed. And on his way home, he died. He didn't even live to get home. He said, ever since, I haven't been able to get away from the fact that God was saying to me, call them to prayer, and I wouldn't. I was afraid of the misunderstanding or the persecution or what it would do to me, and I didn't. And he said, ever since, that's been in my heart. I haven't been able to get away from it. Now he said, I feel that here we have attained oneness of spirit. I feel that we have faced Jesus in his fullness. And we know that Jesus was concerned about the body as well as the mind and the soul and the personality and the emotions and the affairs of men. Now he said, God has laid another concern upon me. In our conference, the head of our youth work, Mrs. Strickland, a person that everyone in our conference recognizes as a wonderful soul whose influence upon youth has been so marked that everyone knows it. We know that today in Millsaps College there are five young men studying for the ministry who have said it was Mrs. Strickland's influence in their life that made them decide to be a minister now she is at the height of her power. She's a woman about 50, I'd say. Her faith is unshaken, and yet they've told her she only has a few more weeks to live. Every time she's tested, her tests show that she's getting weaker and that this thing is progressing. She's been told she only has a few more weeks to live, but her faith is still unshaken. She still says, oh no, the Lord hasn't finished with me. And I know he's going to heal me. Now he said, Ms. Eggleston, I believe here's a group that would stand with her in prayer. Do you? I said, I certainly do. Let's find out. And there wasn't one soul in that group that wasn't willing to stand and stake their life and stake their reputation on knowing that God would want to restore Ruth Strickland. He said, uh, would you be willing for me to send for her and for this group to pray for her tomorrow before this meeting closes? We all said, yes, we would welcome it. And so Ruth Strickland was sent for. Her home is in Kosciuszko. Now, I don't know that I say that right, but maybe you all can understand it. It's an Indian jailbreaker. But it sounds like that. It's 200 miles from Oxford. But the next morning, by mid-morning, she was there. You may be sure that after we had decided that we were willing to be an instrument for this miracle to come to pass. We offered ourselves more completely than we'd ever known how to offer before. For now we saw that God was going to be on trial, that God's word was going to be at stake, and we were staking our lives upon it and our reputation. And these were the leading people in the conference who were staking their reputation, but they were staking it on God. And so you can imagine that we went deeper and deeper and spent more time in silence and quietness, letting the Holy Spirit direct us. By mid-morning, the closing day when the she arrived. There was such a stillness. There was such a quiet assurance that it was really a joy unspeakable that we were experiencing. 
we knew that the Lord was leading and going to take over. And so when they brought her in, the chairs in this auditorium were movable. And they just put them all against the walls and folded them up and cleared the room and brought a comfortable chair to the middle of the room where they put her. And the rest of them made circles around. Of course, at first, we had a little talk with her and let her know how we'd been building up. And uh, we wanted to know if she was ready. We knew she was. It, she revealed it in every way. In fact, she wouldn't have taken that long drive to come there if she hadn't have come with great expectancy and a complete commitment. They asked me if I would stand behind her and make the contact. For you know, Jesus would always touch them or they would reach out and touch him. But God needs a contact. And so they stood and made circles with united hands around her. And I stood back of her with my hands upon her head. At first we remained silent for the Holy Spirit to take over. And then the Lord began to speak through me, declaring our faith repenting of everything that had ever kept us from being used wholly and completely before. It was a prayer of repentance and a great prayer of looking for God to take over completely. The prayer was hardly begun when I felt a great power sweeping through and I knew that something mighty was happening. When the prayer was finished, she stood up. She said, I'm healed. I'm completely well. And I must tell you what happened. She said, when the prayer first began, that door over there opened. It hadn't really opened. Or if it did, none of us saw it because our eyes were closed. But that door opened. And in came a great light. And then I saw in the midst of the light a figure. And it became clearer. And I saw it was Jesus. Slowly he advanced across the room and came over. And he placed his hands upon my head. And as soon as his hands touched my head... His whole power swept through me and I felt the healing take place all over my body. I'm not only well, I'm strong. I feel as wonderful as I ever felt in my life and I know it's complete. Well, about that time, the dinner bell rang, but no one paid any attention. The dinner bell were chimes for every call that you get at this conference. You're called with chimes playing hymns. And these beautiful hymns that were being played only led us deeper into the spirit. We weren't at all interested in dinner. Everyone there had to witness. And there wasn't one present that hadn't had some experience some mystical experience. And there wasn't anyone willing to leave until we had shared our experience. God can always open our spiritual eyes and our spiritual ears and make us sensitive to that divine touch. Yes, every one of our senses can be quickened as we take time to be still in his presence and let his spirit develop them. It was about 2.30 when the last one finished witnessing and we went to our waiting dinner. It was a cold lunch. Wouldn't have made any difference, though. 
We went up and such sheer joy as we had as we partook of our lunch. And then said goodbye and started home. Now I was invited to drive back in the car with Mrs. Strickland. I was making for Jackson and I was in the car with the doctor and Mrs. Samuel Ashmore. He is the editor of the Mississippi Christian Advocate. And she, Mrs. Ashmore, is one of his writers and contributors every week in the Advocate. We drove with Mrs. Strickland back to Cascuesco, and she did the talking. <laughs> the rest of us listened. She talked all the way. She talked with as much life and animation and joy as I've ever heard anyone talk. And when we arrived, it was supper time. She said, won't you come in and have dinner with us? I never felt better in my life. I will get steaks, and I'll give you a steak dinner, and I'll do everything myself if you'll just stay and have dinner. Well, I can't imagine anything we would have loved any better, steaks and all. But uh, I had a plane to catch from Jackson, and we had 80 more miles yet to travel. And so we had to forego that pleasure and uh, go on to Jackson. But you can imagine our joy as we drove knowing that this miracle was full and complete. Not only healed, but strengthened and filled with a new energy that was thrilling to behold. Well, of course, I heard from her. I knew that uh, the tests were all wonderful and complete. But this April... <clears throat> You see, South Mississippi never let North Mississippi get far ahead of it. And so uh, Thomas had uh, planned a retreat in South Mississippi in the Palmer Creek uh, Camp Meeting Ground. It's been a camp meeting ground for a hundred years. And it still has the atmosphere of the old camp meeting right a few miles from the Gulf. Well, here, one of the first to arrive was Ruth Strickland with a carload of women from North Mississippi, including Mrs. Ashmore. She had come all the way down to witness. She wanted them not only to hear, but to see the wonder of the Lord and what God had done with her and through her and for her and to tell of her plans for the summer for the last two years. She had not been able to lead the youth. But her plans were full and complete for her summer youth camps, for all of her summer programs. But she wanted you to see the health, the glow, and she wanted to tell the story. She said she went, uh, I think we perhaps got home on Friday night, and the following Monday or Tuesday, she was taken to Mississippi, as usual, for she was carried there several times, I mean carried to Jackson. She was carried there several times a week, I believe now, for tests. And so she went, not saying anything about what had happened. She went for her test. And they tested. And they tested. And they changed the instruments. And they called in doctors. They called in everybody. And she didn't say anything. And they said, Mrs. Strickland, we are very much embarrassed, but all of our instruments are out of order. Uh, would you be willing for us to take you up to Memphis, to the hospital there and for an examination? And she said gladly she would go. And so they took her to Memphis, and they tested. <laughs> but theirs were all out of order, too. <laughs> and so after it had been checked and double-checked, then she told them what had happened. And they said, well, then, of course, it's only temporary. 
And she said, well, that's all right. I'll continue to come for the test just as long as you desire. They said, we'd like for you to continue coming regularly. She's been going regularly ever since, and all the instruments are still out of order. <laughs> you know, that's wonderful. For the more tests, the more verification you have, the more wonderful it is, isn't it? But she says they still say it's only temporary. We don't believe it. Well, of course, that doesn't bother her one bit. And she will continue to go for the test just as long as they care. Why do these things occur so seldom? Why don't they happen in every church? Oh, it's because we've been neglecting these things. We've let too much of the human come in. We've let our churches get so organized. We've let them be so directed by human minds and human plans that we haven't followed the Holy Spirit all the way. We have pushed out of our churches some of the things that Jesus kept central. Jesus was concerned about everything that happened to anyone. Whether it happened to the body or the mind or the affairs or the emotions or what. Jesus was interested in everything. For he knew what happened that was visible first happened into something that was invisible. And he was interested in catching the thing that was down hidden. And yet they'd never find it except through the visible. And we have let this get away from us. And because we did and we closed our minds to it, we are responsible for so many of the schisms. And the things that have arisen outside of what we call our orthodox churches, they have been started by people with vision who saw that these things were a part of the kingdom. They were a part of the church, and we drove them out. Stanley Jones says we owe a great, great debt of gratitude to Christian science. And that Christian science would have never come into being if we had listened and uh, opened our eyes and let these things come back in the church if we hadn't driven them out. We drove them out. You know we did. Our prayer group would have been driven out if we had been willing to have been driven. But we stayed in and took it. Now, the kingdom isn't coming until we recognize that in every one of these, there is good, there is truth. And we've got to stop building barriers and help them see that we're all one. And while maybe we were neglecting this, that they in their eagerness to plank this Sometimes I've left out other things that were even more important. Not one of us have it all. But everyone has something to contribute. We've got to be big enough and loving enough to see the good everywhere and come together, all of us, bringing what we have to offer and put it together. And then when we've brought everything we have, God still has to give us a lot more. But he's waiting. And that great prayer given in the upper room is not going to be fulfilled until we're willing to break down the barriers. The burden of his prayer, asked twice in the same prayer, was that we might all be one that the world might believe. And the world is not believing today because we're not acting like one family. Now, I think our camps have done as much to break down barriers between denominations and help us Christians, regardless of our 
denominational tag, to act like one family, and to strengthen every church, everyone who's trying to follow the living Christ. Are we making room for him in our hearts? For it isn't going to happen in the world until it first happens in our hearts. We're going to sit now for the next few moments in a quiet meditation, examining our hearts, and inviting this Holy Spirit to possess us and give us the courage to follow where his spirit is leading. <laughs>